Hi, I'm Adam. Welcome back to Godot Game Lab. In this course, we'll be creating a single player auto battler in Godot 4. Let me show you how it works. As you can see, we have our arena here in the middle. On the right hand side, we see our current gold and we can buy units or we can reroll the current units to new ones like so. In the top right corner, we can see the current XP we need for the next level and also our current level. And we can buy XP with this button next to it. And down in the middle, we have our bench where we can reorder and arrange our units we just bought. So let me buy a couple of units like so. And we can always reroll for new ones. You can see if you buy three or more similar units, they will combine into a higher tier unit like these ones right here and we can keep buying and rolling for units if at any point your bench is full then the next unit you'll buy will be added to the battlefield instead let's see if we can get a tier 3 unit for example and we did okay so now you can see that we have an exclamation mark here because we have four units on the grid but we can only have one according to our xp level so if we buy some xp we can reach level four and this means that we can actually use four units on the battlefield but if we don't like the arrangement we can drag and drop units to new rows or new cells in the battlefield we can also see that we have a slight little dragging animation based on the velocity of dragging to make it look a bit more interesting and we can move around the units, we can swap them. And we can also swap them out for other units on the bench, like so. You can also see the traits on the left. So in this case, we have the elves, the vikings, the fighters and the rangers, but none of these traits are active. You can see the amount of units you have on the board with that trait. And also you can see the requirements for the different tier of bonuses you can have for those traits. So if I drag that elf back, you'll see that it lights up, indicating that it's active and the number two is sort of highlighted with this yellow text color. One thing you can also do is you can sell units. So you can either drag and drop them over the selling portal, which will highlight and also indicate the amount of gold you get back. Or you can just hover over the units and sell them with the quick sell button, which is set to letter S on my keyboard. So by pressing S repeatedly, I can sell my units and you can see that I get the gold back. Also, the gold is calculated dynamically for the tier of the unit. So we spent like 9 gold to combine this unit and we can get 9 gold back. And that's all there is to it for season one of this course. Before we jump into the project, let's start with the architecture first, like we usually do. So just like last time, this course is aimed more towards intermediate or confident level Godot users who want to build bigger stuff, right? So I kind of expect you to be familiar with how the node and the scene system works in Godot and how we can rely on the signal system to sort of communicate between those nodes and decouple responsibilities. What can you expect from season one of this course in terms of scalability and flexibility? Just like with the State Aspire course, I tried my best to create a scalable and flexible solution for this kind of game. In terms of scripts, we have 30 for the first season, which is not too bad if you ask me, with a combined total of just a bit more than 1300 lines of code. The longest class is called the unit combiner and it consists of 96 lines of code with white spaces included for both of those numbers. This means that yes, we do a lot of coding, but it will be split up into smaller digestible chunks. So if you watch my State Aspire clone course, you might wonder what's different with this one. Well, first of all, we'll use a component based approach to sort of show you a different way of handling things in Godot by using granular components, which can be reused in a lot of different contexts. Also, we relied on the event bus pattern a lot in the Slate Aspire clone course. So I decided to drop it for this one just to kind of show you that there's no holy grail, right? You can do this with the event bus, but you can also create a good system and a good design without the event bus. So 
I just wanted to show you that you don't necessarily need to use all these techniques all the time to create good quality code. Also, what's really different for me as well, and probably for you too, is that I plan to do two seasons from the get go. So what this means in terms of this auto battler is that the two seasons are probably more equally distributed in terms of content. And I already know what kind of features we will end up with. Also, this one will focus more on gameplay because I don't want to do redundant stuff. What does that mean? For example, we did a lot of UI stuff in the Slade Aspire clone course, like main menus, character selector, the pause menu, the deck view scene. So there was a lot of like systems coming together that are not necessarily related to the gameplay, the core part of the gameplay, right? And I don't want to do them over again because you can just watch those videos if you want to learn an approach on doing a main menu, for example. So this course will strictly focus on the gameplay part. Okay, so what about the architecture of this game? On the very top, we have the root node, which is called the arena, and it's going to be pretty small. Its only real responsibility is to connect the different systems together with signals. Other than that, it just plays the music you heard when I showed you the demo. Under the arena, we'll have a node called visuals, which contains all the visual stuff, which is eye candy, not related to the gameplay, like the background tiles, the props, particle systems, and so on. Then we have the game area, which is the area in the middle. It has the checkerboard style of tiles and the components. These components are the unit grid and the tile highlighter component, which we'll talk about in a second. Then we have the bench, which is pretty similar, but it just holds your current units, right? Which are not in play. So again, it has tiles and it also has a bunch of components attached to it. The same components are used here, the unit grid and the tile highlighter. Then we have a cell portal, which is like its own separate thing, which handles unit selling in two ways, either by dropping a unit over it or by hovering over a unit and pressing the quick sell button. Then, last but not least, we also have UI related stuff, right? It's not that much yet in season one, but we have the shop UI, we have the traits on the left, and we have that little team size play with the exclamation mark in the middle. That's how the high level architecture looks like. It's not too bad, I think, but you also need to understand that we need a bunch of other components to make this work. So what are those components? Well, we have the tile highlighter, which is solely responsible for highlighting a hovered tile on a tile map layer node. This is used when you move the mouse over the bench and it can be reused again when you move the mouse over the game area, right? Or your side of the game area. Then we have the unit grid, which is more like a gameplay logic related component. It keeps track of units inside the grid based on coordinates. Then we have a drag and drop component, which handles dragging and dropping something. This is super useful because yes, right now we can only use this for units in the game, but imagine in the future in season two, where we introduce items to the mix, similar to how it works in Teamfight Tactics, then you can drag and drop items as well over the units, right? When we develop the new feature, we can just reuse the drag and drop component. It's not tied to the unit's functionality. Then we have an outline highlighter, which highlights something with a configurable outline. It uses a shader to achieve that. Then we have a velocity-based rotation component, which you guessed it, rotates something based on its current velocity. We use this for units, right? Just like you saw in the demo. Then we have three other ones, the unit combiner, the unit mover, and the unit spawner. I highlighted those with yellow because they are not components in a sense that we won't be reusing them anywhere else in the game, but I kind of wanted to include them here because they are similar in a fashion that they only do one single thing and they could be reused, but won't be, right? So we can sort of think of them as single use components, although this kind of defeats the purpose. Unit Combiner is the longest code in the whole Season 1 codebase, and it's responsible for combining three or more units to their bigger tier versions recursively. This means that when you combine three units from the lowest tier to a higher one, it might happen that this new unit needs to be combined as well, right? So that's a bit of a more complex topic or the, one of the most complex codes we write in this season. Then we have the unit mover, which handles moving units between the arena and the bench and also swapping units, right? And finally, we have the unit spawner, which handles spawning a unit at the first available tile when you buy a new unit from the shop. What about the data management for this game? Well, it's not too bad either. 
we have a resource called game state, which stores the current game state, which is either a preparation phase or a fighting phase. We need to define this because, for example, you can't really swap out units or sell units from the arena or the game area when a fight is happening, right? So we need to differentiate between those two states throughout the whole game. Then we have player stats, things like the current level, the amount of XP or gold the player has, stuff like this. We have the unit pool, which is the pool of currently available units. I talk about the unit pool more in detail when we implement it, but the solution is really similar to how the unit pool and shopping works in Teamfight Tactics. Then we have the trade resource which contains a lot of data connected to traits, like visual stuff, like the name and the icon, also a description, and the different amount of levels and requirements you have for activating traits. We also have a unit stats resource, which is used by units, and it has a bunch of data connected to it as well. Visual stuff like the sprite of the unit, then you have the gold cost, rarity, also the name of the unit, what traits the unit has, what tier it currently is at, and so on. And I think basically that's it. So it's not too bad on the data and component side. Pretty straightforward, but there's a lot to learn, I promise. So finally, let's talk about what's not in season one. I want this to act like sort of an FAQ. If you want to write a comment, hey, Adam, will this be included in a future video? All of these features will be included, but in season two instead of season one. OK, so you can expect unit abilities and modifiers tooltips for units, traits, and so on, item system, which lets you combine items and boost the stats of the units, also fighting enemies, and AI for those enemies you fight. Okay, so all of these will be available in the future in Season 2. If you like my content, please consider checking out my coffee page, where you can donate one time or become a member and get early access to all my content and videos. So that's it for this video, and I guess I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.